just a wonderful presence and just goodness. I tell you, I just can't imagine what heaven's going to have in store for us Amen. when we get there. I tell you, I truly, truly, truly am looking forward to when Jesus comes to get us. And, and you know, I, I had a person, a friend, I guess, on Facebook that had sent me a message early this morning and told me that the young child that we was all praying for had um, went home to be with the Lord this morning. And heartbreaking, sad. And I thought of this stuff many times before, but tonight just sitting there listening to y'all sing and and I just couldn't help but think about that child that left this world. And one of the first things that I said this morning was, isn't that awful, wasn't that sad that, they, that the child left this world to go to Jesus? And the more I thought of that comment and statement, well, we know what we mean by it when we say it's sad. But if we really, really in our heart could understand just what heaven is, and just where that child's born. I mean, even if it was one of our own. If we, and we can't really grasp it. We can read the Word of God. We can hear it preached. Hear it taught. But it just, for some reason, we just can't grasp it in our heart. What really takes place when we lose our loved one and they go in the arms of Jesus. If we really understood it, Bob, I don't know if we would be so sad. I honestly don't know if we would be really that sad. We can say, oh, it's in their arms of Jesus and, and all that, and we know that, but I think if we, honestly, I think of that little baby, and, and when I said that this morning, that is so sad, and, and I hate to hear that this baby left this world, and, 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 and I thought, but where that child gone? Where our loved ones go? That one day when it's my time to leave this world and I leave loved ones behind, I can say with all assurity that I know where I can go because Jesus made the way for me to get there. Amen. And I just don't understand that as much as I've taught and preached and, and studied on heaven, Bob, I just can't really get it understood in my mind or in my heart exactly what it's going to be like. But I want you to know something, just a little piece that I know, it's going to be worth it Amen. all. Amen. It is going to be worth it all. And yes, we hate to part with loved ones. We hate to say goodbye. But I think sometimes I just wish that we can, and I, I believe we could if we really prayed and, 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 and really sought God's face on the matter. I think He can really reveal more of heaven than what we know of. But the, John wasn't allowed to write it all down. He saw it. Revelation said John wasn't allowed to write it all down. He wrote down the splendors of heaven and what it's going to be like and what the joy, and, and, and Nana kept singing that song, and, and when I look up on his face, uh, and I just see myself standing there, uh, and not be able to utter a word, uh, but just with my eyes, look on the face uh, of the one who shed his blood uh, for me, that I can be standing in that place where I can see him face to face. Uh, and I, that just blows my mind. Blows my mind. But I tell you what, heaven is for real. Amen. What's going to be there may blow our mind. But it's going to be worth it. Our loved ones, if they're saved and they leave this world as sad as it is, I want you to know that we don't have to say goodbye, that we can just say see you later because I'm going to be there too. I thank God for that promise. I thank God for that promise that we don't have to say goodbye. I don't even have no earthly idea why I'm saying that. That is not even the message. I'm going to be talking about the ark in Genesis chapter 6. But I guess the reason why that was coming to my mind is I was reading about the ark and studying a little bit. And, and I love when I go into the, the Old Testament and start reading things and see Jesus all over. That just does something to me. Can I get a little bit of water? That just does something for me. I know we can go in the New Testament of God's Word and we can find Christ everywhere. We can find Him talking and, and, and written in red and all these good things. Uh, but there's a lot of people uh, that you talk to uh, and they'll simply say that the old Bible is what they'll call it. Uh, they'll say, you know what, uh, you can't find Jesus in, in, in the old Bible. But I want you to know we can. Amen. 
But everything that I read, and I tell you, ever since I've heard that, it's been my mission uh, to read the Old Testament and, and pray and study, uh, and God will reveal exactly where Christ is uh, in all these aspects. Uh, and I want to share just a little bit with you tonight. Uh, we're going to be reading in chapter 6 of Genesis. Uh, um, we'll probably won't read the whole entire chapter. Thank you, dear. We probably won't read the whole entire chapter, but because you know the the, the story. <coughs> when Noah was commissioned by the Lord to build an ark, you know the, the, the story behind it. You know why? We know that sons and daughters were born, and you know that the earth was multiplied. And it seems the more that there's people gather, the more there is, the more trouble it seems like there are. seems like wherever you go, if you find a lot of people, there's a lot of trouble. And you add more people into the mix, you just add more trouble. And, and, and God many times in the scripture has revealed that the earth became violent and filled with evil. And the more we read this in a moment, and the more you're going to see that even though this was way back in the beginning of time and, and as man was evolving and, and man was um, growing and, and, and learning and, and given free will, you know this was right after the Garden of Eden and after Adam was sent out and all. Uh, and folks, before then, uh, they had free will, uh, but they didn't know any sin until after uh, they disobeyed God. You know the story from there. Uh, but these people, they was growing in, in, in knowledge and, and the Bible teaches that they were, their eyes were open and they was as God. Now the scripture doesn't teach that they were God. But they were as God. And the reason why he said that is because their eyes were open and they knew good and evil. They knew what was sin and what was not sin. See, in the Garden of Eden, they didn't know what sin was. They had never heard of it. It never existed to them until the first disobedience. And then sin was revealed in their heart. Well, time went more on, time went past, and they seen that the world was growing more and more evil. In verse 8, well, let me go to verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> These are the generations of Noah. And Noah was just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. And if you go down to 14, it starts to talk about where God had told Noah that he's going to build the ark. It says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make in the ark. And in, a, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof. With lower, with lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. From under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. And I'm not going to read much more of that, 
We know that after God had given the commission to build this, we know that, that He gave the, the directions, He gave the instructions, I told Him exactly how big He wanted it, and, and all the measurements was precise. Everything that He wanted for this ark, there was a reason for it. There was a purpose. For it. See, it, makes, it amazes me whether we look at the ark uh, or whether we go and we read about the ark of the covenant uh, where there was a box and how it was made uh, and we know what was laying and it was laying in and out with gold. Uh, we know in the ark of the covenant uh, that David had carried around and, and the Levites, we know that the dimensions of it was precise. Uh, Everything that God had told them to make, whether it was the temple, uh, whether it was the tent that they'd go in and worship, everywhere, anytime they built something, uh, there was dimensions and there was a reason why God wanted it perfectly. And folks, I thought of that and I thought, you know what? Uh, it's just no different then when God had designed this plan, uh, He planned it out, and I just love uh, in my mind to try to envision uh, this blueprint of the ark. Uh, and folks, let me tell you something. Uh, like I said, everything that He built, uh, just imagine a blueprint. Uh, but let me tell you this. Uh, some 2,000 years ago, uh, there was another plan, uh, and there was another blueprint uh, that was set out. Uh, folks, and this was for salvation uh, for the souls of man. Uh, there was a plan uh, that God had set for uh, folks, in this time, uh, this plan was perfect. Uh, every plan that he had uh, was set in place. Uh, and Christ was willing uh, to go uh, and do everything that God wanted him to do. Uh, step in every place that he wanted us to step. Uh, for the reason of this, uh, folks, he died on the cross. Uh, and you and I uh, could have life and have it more abundantly. There was a plan set. There was a blueprint in heaven set just for our sacrifice. For our sins. We wasn't worthy of it. Sin required it. Sin required for us to die. Sin required for us to atone for our sin. But the only problem was, was we're not pure enough. There was nothing in us that could save ourselves. We can go way back in Exodus, uh, and when they'd done the uh, Passover, uh, and they said, find a perfect lamb that was two years or under, uh, no blemishes, no problems, no sickness, nothing in it. Had to be pure, and had to be perfect. Folks, that lamb was the Passover. Jesus Christ was used for our Passover. Amen. Jesus Christ was used for our sacrifice, uh, for our sin. And as I read this, I thought, man, this is interesting. Because you would think that he'd say, you know what, just build you a big enough boat that carries everybody, uh, and then good luck. But he didn't. Everything that he said was precise. Everything that he told him, told Noah to build, uh, every measurement was for a reason. And I thought, you know what, uh, and I had, you know me, I have to jot all this stuff down, I can't remember all of it. But as we read and we see where God had told him to come onto the boat and it was about ready to rain, as Noah went out and preached and told and warned people, uh, let me tell you this, I don't know if you know this or not, but when people was coming to Noah and they was mocking and laughing and ridiculing Noah for building this, it wasn't just because they was laughing because he was building this humongous boat that they'd never seen before. But they also was laughing at him because instead of building the boat by the water, he built it out in dry, open land where there was no water. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Think about that. Think about that for a moment. I'm not very smart, uh, but if I'm going to build me a house, uh, I'm going to build it away from the water. If I'm going to build me a boat, uh, I'm going to build it as close to the water as I can possibly get because I'm planning for my boat to float. But he built it far away. And that was another reason why people was laughing and mocking. And uh, you're building a boat. Uh, you heard this rain coming down from the sky. Uh, we've never seen that before. That's just a fable. It never does that. Any time that you water the plants or anything, the water came up from the ground. It never came up from the sky down. So Noah was telling these people this, and they was laughing and mocking them. And you're building this big old boat in the middle of dry ground. Where are you getting the water from to float this? The Lord. See, let me tell you something. When God tells us to do something, when He gives us a, 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 a job to do, 
Sometimes it may not make sense to a lot of people. Sometimes it may not even make sense to yourself. But see, only thing God wants from us is obedience. God didn't want our lip. God didn't want to give us, you know what, let me explain this to you, Daddy. He's never done that for us. 25 years. He's called me to do something. And I don't understand why. He's never one time sat me down and explained the whole plan to me. He just told me what my part was and expected me to carry it out. And the rest of it, he wanted me to be faithful and obedient. That's all he required. He didn't owe me no explanation. No, it didn't sit there and say, now God, you're going to give me detail on what you're doing and how you're doing. No, it didn't do that. He just trusted the Lord. So for over a hundred years, he worked on this ark. Some says 110, some says 120. I kind of, my math, I kind of get a hundred years. But I'm not the greatest math student. But let's just say 100 plus years, he worked on the ark preached and told people and people was like well it's not right yet I've heard it can you imagine he started on year one how about when he got to about year 70 and he's still working and people still question him and he said wait a minute Noah you worked on this for 70 years nothing's happened yet I've heard it all my life <laughs> have we ever heard that I heard from time I was a little kid that Jesus is coming back nothing's happened yet well, you better be thankful it didn't because your life ain't right with God. A lot of people that's not believers, they're not right with God, and they say, well, Jesus hasn't come back yet. Well, you better be thankful he has. Once again, he's shown grace. But one day, he's coming back. One day, the Bible teaches us in Revelation that it's going to rain fire. Now, I've seen volcanoes and lava shoot up way up in the, eye, at the sky and it comes down like rain. But one day, fire everywhere is just going to come down. Amen. Like rain. I've never seen that. Thank God I don't want to see it. I want to be gone when that happens. But as he was preparing, I want you to get some of this, and it's not very long. But I jotted down just a few things that I thought was pretty interesting when we're thinking about the ark. And, and it amazes me how much parallel it is of Christ and of his life. Number one, it said that we read, in, and I believe it's verse 14, and it says to use gopher wood. And any time that you read about gopher wood, which really is, is, is in here, but there's a lot of study books and stuff talking about gopher wood, they actually associated gopher wood as a type of humanity, it's precious. Humanity is sinful, evil, violent, self-destructive. Am I right or wrong? Have I described humanity pretty well? But humanity also is the creation of God. And therefore, if God has a part in it, then there has a potential of having good. In God's eyes, humanity is worth His Son's life. He gave His only begotten Son for you and I. He loved humanity. Even though we're evil and sinful, self-destructive, He sees potential in you and I. He, he, he kind of acquitted us as, as part of gopher wood. And it says, one, to build the ark, trees had to be cut down. They, when they built that ark, we see on TV and different ones that, you know, God says, okay, we want you to build this, and everything that he, had, he needed was right there. I don't really believe that's how it happened, but you know what? If it was good for Noah, less he had to do, right? But I believe he had to be obedient, and sometimes, folks, when God calls us to do something, he will equip us to do it, but we have to go out and do it. He'll give us the strength to do it, he may not always give us what we need, but he'll give us the strength to get what we need. But it says to build the ark, they had to cut down trees. It says to provide a way of salvation. The man Jesus had to be cut down. Think about that for a moment. In order for the ark of safety, in order for this ark to be created, to be built, trees had to be prepared, trees had to be cut down. 
and Jesus when he prepared a way for eternal life. When he became that bridge for you and I. His life had to be cut down. He had to sacrifice his life. He had to give his life that we can live. He had to die so we could live. Not just live on earth, but live eternally. Have everlasting life. Without Jesus Christ, without him shedding his blood, church, we are lost and eternally lost. Amen. But because of his blood, what he done on Calvary, he was cut down. Then it talked about when Noah had to take pitch and, and all these, what I'm reading to you is what we can find in the scripture. I didn't read it to you in your hearing, but you know that he said the next thing was after the gopher wood, he said to take pitch. Pitch was something like tar or asphalt. Uh, and what they would do is they would seal it from the inside and the outside. And what it was, it was a seal. So no water could get in. Because without it, the boat wouldn't float. And it said that as they used the pitch, it was, a, it was a type of an atonement. I love that. Think about that for a moment. That pitch, that asphalt, that tar was a type of an atonement. It said it covered the wood. Christ's blood covered our sin. The pitch acted as a waterproof, as a sealant. But the blood of Christ does the very same thing. The blood of Christ that's applied to our heart will not only seal our heart, wash away our sins, but the blood of Christ will repel evil. It will repel, the Bible says, the fiery darts of the devil. It will repel. It will repel the very evil which is Satan. If we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, I want you to know something. The devil can come and he can try to attack us, but I want you to know he cannot penetrate our heart. If it's covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I love the symbolism. We think of the ark. And we think about the boat. Uh, but I see Jesus all through this. Number three. It says. It talks about the abode. It talks about the rooms. Now listen to this. It says the rooms in the ark. Were meant for rest. Not just safety. But for rest. So when the people. And let me tell you something. Not only was this ark created for the animals, but it was also created for people. Only sad thing is, is animals had more sense than the people did. When the animals were called by God to board the boat, now I, I, I love on that TV show or movie, Evan Almighty, I think it was called, uh, I love the, the picture when it was time to load all the animals on the boat. Uh, I love that picture where they didn't have to go out and find it, uh, but they just, it just like drawn to the ark. They came on their own. And I thought, you know what, that is a great thought. I often wondered how in the world did they get so many animals together? But see, God has a voice that not only human beings, but animals and all, hears and understands. And it's not unusual for God to use an animal for our use. I believe He called these animals. I believe He called them. Think about that. Why wouldn't He? Because He had a plan. He had a reason for that. But as the animals came into the boat, and I'm going to get to that just one second because I thought this was interesting. We've got to do some math. Get your thinking caps on. But as all the animals came into the boat, there was still plenty of room for humans. Plenty of room for people. Aren't you glad? Think about this. The Bible gives us measurements of heaven in Revelation. 1,500 miles square. From my understanding, it has 12, 12 foundations. This is heaven. 1,500 miles square. I used to know this by heart, and I don't remember a lot of things, but that's the equivalent from here, I think, almost to California. Square. There's a lot of room in heaven. And if you notice, we'll never read about God enlarging heaven. But we read about the Bible saying that hell is enlarged every day. Why is that? Because hell was a small place. Only created for the devil and his angels. But when people sin and they leave this world in eternity, 
The only place they can go is hell. If they have no blood of Jesus in their life, the only place they go is the devil's hell. And the Bible says that every day people are going there to where hell is enlarging itself. Well, why doesn't heaven enlarge itself? I heard somebody say, well, because not that many people go to heaven. I don't really believe that. Now, I do believe there's not a lot of people going to heaven because if they're going to hell, they can't go to heaven. But I believe that heaven was created with every single human being in mind. I believe heaven was created to occupy every human being that was ever created. Because the Bible teaches us that's not his will that any should perish. So if God had a will for people not to perish, then he's already planned for people to be there. Now, whether they go or not, that's up to us because we got free will. But however, if we choose to go, God ain't going to scramble around and say, oh, better add another room to our house because he's already built it big enough to occupy every one of us should we choose to go. I believe that's why heaven isn't enlarged because I believe it's already big enough to occupy everybody if they chose to go. Think about that. And then this ark was big enough for not all the animals, but not only all the animals, but every person on that planet that wanted to go, if they chose to go. But they laughed. They, they thought. And once again, the rooms were meant for rest. Well, Jesus said, come unto me, and I'll give you rest. Think about that. Let me talk just a few moments about the size of the ark. It says that the length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it, 30 cubits. Let me break that down. The size of the ark is 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. That's 1,518,750 cubic square feet. It says each deck contains 33,000 750 feet of floor space. That's the equivalent of 21 basketball courts together. So each level, all three levels, was the size of 21 basketball courts. Try to get that in your mind. It says it is estimated that there's a, at least 35,000 known species of animals that could fit in the ark which was the equivalent of about 150 boxcars. But the size of the ark was the size of 530 boxcars. So if you take 150 boxcars away from 530, my number is 380 boxcars. That was free for human beings. Folks, aren't you glad tonight to know that there is room for everyone? There is room for us. I'm glad that we can look and we can think about the ark and, and it's more than just Noah built an ark and people laughed at him but it rained and people got on the boat and took off and it landed about a few months later or a year or so much later right? and then they got off and they started all over again. There's more to that than that story. There was lessons for you and I to learn. There's an understanding for you to guide, for us to get to realize that this ark represented Jesus Christ. Way back in Genesis, uh, this ark that we're talking about uh, represented our, our, our Savior, the one who's seen us at our worst, but loved us anyway. The one who knows our sins, uh, knows our thoughts, knows the tents of our heart, uh, but said, I'm willing to lay my life down. I, I'm willing to give them salvation. I, I'm willing to give them protection. I, I'm willing to give them rest. I, I'm willing to be their all in all. Uh, all they've got to do uh, is just get on the boat. Uh, all they've got to do uh, is accept me uh, and take me at my word uh, that I will be with them uh, and never leave them uh, or forsake them uh, and I will get them uh, to the other side. Uh, Folks, let me tell you something. It's not the boat that we want to be on, but it's Jesus Christ who's going to take us home. Man. I want to get to just a few more things and we'll stop. But before I do, we're going to talk about the door 
We're going to talk about the window. Those were two things that was mentioned on this ark. Those are two things that was mentioned that God gave specific orders for. Top of your head, I'm not trying to trick you, but just the top of your head real quick. And you all might know this. I didn't. I, didn't. It just, I totally missed it. But did you, when you read this about the ark and you see what God wanted and what God told you, told Noah to build, have you noticed that he never talked about a steering wheel? Never talked about way, how, how Noah's going to navigate this? I guess I knew it, but didn't know it. Never dawned on me. We can never find in the Word of God where God said, okay, we want a rudder back here uh, and we want you to be able to steer this out of trouble and steer it away from this or that. We never find uh, where there is a quote-unquote steering wheel in the ark. Only thing God told Noah to do uh, is get your family on it, get the animals on it. Uh, God himself uh, sealed the door closed uh, and then when the water rose uh, and it started taking float, uh, it wasn't by chance, uh, it wasn't by accident uh, they didn't stand in the corner crossing their fingers uh, hoping they'd go somewhere safe, uh, but they trusted uh, in God Almighty uh, to steer that boat. Uh, he trusted in God uh, to direct them where they need to go. Uh, church, let me tell you what a wonderful picture it is uh, of us uh, when we give our life to God uh, we said, God, here's my life. You take it and you use it. But yet we want to try to steer. But folks, all we need to do is trust God and His navigation. He knows where we're going. He knows where, what travel, what place, what path He wants us to take. And just like Noah, he got on the boat and said, you know what? My life is in your hands. I'm going to let you steer. I'm going to let you take me wherever, Lord, you want me to go. And church, what a wonderful picture that is for you and I. I see these bumper stickers. I know what they mean, but I just don't care for them. Jesus is my co-pilot. Honey, switch seats. I want God to do the drive. I want to go where he tells me to go. I find out in my life, the more I just let go and say, God, you direct me and let me follow your path, the better off I am. But when I want to get all happy in myself and move over, Lord, I want to drive for a while, I always find myself in a rut. Always. Always, always. And then I have to call tow truck Jesus to get me out. Pull me out once again, Lord. But we let Him do the navigation. Let Him do the plan. Let Him tell us what's best for us. And let us quit trying to figure it out on our own. We had a chance, and we blew it. We had that chance to figure things out on our own. We had that chance to do things the right way, and we blew it. That's why Christ had to come down and die, because nobody else would do it. They wasn't worthy. We done wrecked it. We done sinned in the garden. So I want you to understand next time you read about the ark and you talk about the ark, I want you to get a picture in your head about Jesus Christ. Don't just focus on the boat. The focus on the Lord. There was a door that they had to go through in order to get to safety. We can go in, I believe it's St. John. I think I wrote it down. St. John... Um, um, chapter 10, I think. Chapter, yeah, St. John 10 and 9. And Jesus said, I am the door. We must go through Jesus Christ if we're going to get to safety. If we're going to get to heaven. If we want salvation. Regardless of what people said, that there's many ways to heaven and many roads and, and many garbage. Garbage. There's only one way to to, to God, one way to heaven, and that is through by Jesus Christ. Amen. No other way. It was mentioned here sometime tonight, somebody, and I can't remember who said it, but we, it don't make no difference how, I think Nana said, no matter how good we are. I mean, you know what, whether we're saved or not, we, we can be raised with good morals. 
People think just because they're not saved that they can go out and be a simple, I mean, before I got saved, I still had good morals. I still knew what right and wrong was. Whether I did it always is a different story. But I was raised to respect, and I was raised to do this and that. I had good morals. But good morals won't save us, as has already been said. But that door on the side of the ark, Noah didn't say, hey, everybody jump on. I'm closing it up. Noah had no, what's the word I'm looking for? He had no authority over that. Had no say so. When it was time to close, the Bible teaches us as the hand of God. That closed that. And one of the last things that I thought was very interesting was the window that they said to build. The cubic square, square. Some studies, I find a cubic is 21 inches. Others, I find a cubic is 18 inches. So you can use whichever measurement that you like. I don't even know which one I use when I study this. But that window wasn't typically a window that we see on the side of the wall. Bible says to put the window up top. It's a funny place for a window. So all these pretty pictures and TV shows that you see of people walking on the deck of the ark like it was a love boat or something, it was. It wasn't the Titanic. It wasn't a luxury cruise. They didn't walk around and just sipping on their martinis or whatever they did. That's not what the ark was. It was an ark of safety. It was rest, protection. They didn't walk around the deck. They were secure inside, but there was one window. And I love the purpose of this. Number one, the window was there for light. Number two, I never really thought of this, but also the window was there to catch fresh rainwater. If somebody had done a scale of what they thought the ark according to the measurements were and all that, and they said that it was very possible that when it rained, all that rain, what would happen is the window would catch it and they made a, a vial to where they could catch water. And for the period that they was on the ark, that fresh water, see, salt water, sea water, it don't taste very good. They needed water to sustain them. They needed water to sustain their animals. There's another reason why they made that window. I wasn't Noah's idea, that was God's idea. You see the picture I'm painting? Every aspect of the ark, everything that God told Noah to build was a reason, was a purpose for that. There was benefits for that. Now Noah might have said, you know what, why in the world? Would you want a window up top? Let's put it down here so we at least see where we're going. Lack of faith. See, they was walking by faith, not by sight. Scripture teaches us that we need to do that. We need to do that. We need to, when we know that the Lord leading us, even though we don't know what's on the other side, trust Him. Be faithful to Him. And number three, I can't find this anywhere. This is just my own brain working or malfunctioning, however you want to describe it. But I think that window was there for when they're scared, when they're worried. But I don't know about you. I'm a little claustrophobic. If I'm somewhere where it's cold, closed up, and I can't see outside, I want to know what's going on. And perhaps when they felt that way, all they had to do was kneel down and look up. And when we look up, we will find someone is looking down. And that's our Heavenly Father. I believe that window was there for them to pray. I believe that window was there so they can seek God's face. And, and when they're scared and they're nervous and when they're floating down and they're hitting the side of the mountain and hitting this and hitting that and they don't know what it is, I believe that they looked up through that window and said, God, but we've got to trust you with our life. Wonderful pictures of what God does for his people. And it was so sad that only eight of them accepted that when there was so much room for so many more. 
so much room. It says the provision of the ark, it gave promise. It gave preservation. It gave plenty. If you read in 6.21, God said, take all the food that you want. No limitations. Take everything you want to eat. No limitations. There's plenty for his people. And lastly, I'm not going to go into all of it. I'll just read it to you. It says the performance of the ark. It rose to safety. We can find that where it landed in chapter 7 of Genesis 18.21. It says, while, I love this. Think about this. It says, while the world beneath the ark perished, the ark rose safely above the judgment. I wrote this down once and I forgot it. Terrible of me. But I believe the highest peak in the world is Mount Everest. And I re used to remember how high it was. But it said that the water, it didn't name Everest by name, but it said the water rose 21 feet higher than the highest peak on the earth. 21 feet. Higher than the highest peak. So there was no way of escape. I don't know, back years ago they had that on television, that Noah's Ark on television. Such a mockery. And I don't even know where they got the story from because it wasn't Bible. But they was walking on the ark on the boat and they was sailing and here comes Lot and he was in a paddle boat just a paddling and laughing and carrying on as the water was flooding. Garbage. Garbage. Mockery. God said anyone that was not on the ark of safety would be destroyed. When I seen that, to me that gave a picture that there's other ways of getting around judgment. When judgment comes, if you're not in the ark of safety, you are going to be judged and you will perish. And as that ark was floating on judgment, underneath people was perishing for their sins. But whoever was in the ark of safety, whoever was in that ark, survived. And not only did they survive, but they were protected. They were preserved. They had plenty. They rode safely. And, through, and though the world was drowning in sin, we as Christians can rise above in safety. Those are just some of it. I didn't give you everything that I studied. But think about that tonight. Next time you hear about the ark, Noah's ark, I want you to understand that Jesus is our safe, ark of safety. When you think of the boat and you think of the creation and you think of all the details, there is a reason for it that benefited these people. Folks, when God calls you, when He tells you to do something, even though you don't understand it, trust Him. Of everything in that ark, what blows my mind the most was they had no ability to steer it. Only option they had was just to get on and trust the Lord. Tonight, all the option we have is just to get on board with Jesus Christ and let Him steer us, let Him navigate us to where He knows He wants us to be. And that takes a lot of faith. But the Bible teaches us that every man is given a measure of faith. But it's not something we have to muster up. It's something he already gave us. He gave us the measure of faith. To trust in the Lord. And I'm glad that even in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ was right there trying to keep us. He's there for us every single day. He's there for us in our life. We just have to trust him. Even when we can't figure it out, when we can't see what he's wanting to do in our life. To say, I trust you with my life. So I have my life.